when we're thinking about the philosophy of beauty, one issue seems to inevitably rise to the fore, at least within the Anglophone world of philosophy, and that is the so-called question of the subjectivity or objectivity of beauty. As much as this distinction between the subjective and the objective has been criticized in the history of philosophy, both in the continental and in the analytic traditions, it seems to continue to assert itself um, to be almost inevitable when we're thinking about certain phenomena, and beauty is one of these. We know the cliche that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Many of us um, nowadays are still familiar with John Keats' um, famous Ode to a Grecian Urn, which ends with the stirring lines, uh, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know, roughly speaking. I'm uh, reciting it from memory, so that's not exactly right, probably. But you get the idea that there's a connection between beauty and truth. And what we find embodied here is really two of the dominant historical strains in the history of Western philosophy. Um, on the one hand, you have the Platonist understanding of beauty as um, a kind of absolute reality. Um, in the Middle Ages, beauty is seen as a so-called transcendental a feature of being as such or transmutable with being as well as with goodness, although um, having a somewhat uh, controversial uh, status as a transcendental, but we won't get into that issue. Um, but at any rate, in contemporary terms, beauty is seen as objective. And then in the modern era, when really the, the dichotomy between the subjective and the objective first becomes theorized as such, and subjectivity and objectivity come to take on their modern senses, uh, which are roughly the reverse of the senses they had in the Middle Ages. Uh, at this stage, we also get the rise of the theory of taste, where taste is regarded as a um, personal phenomenon, something that is um, a property of the human mind rather than of objects independent of that mind, or at the very least, it has something like the status of our ability to perceive colors or other so-called Lockean secondary qualities. And so it involves um, a capacity that is very much inflected by the way in which the human mind processes things and is not necessarily to be found in things as they're viewed through the most objective lens, which of course, as always, is assumed to be the lens of science. Now, a key figure in this story is Immanuel Kant, because Kant, in many ways, can be viewed as someone who goes back and recovers or attempts to recover elements of the uh, Platonic and the medieval um, understanding of the nature of beauty, but at the same time is very much conscious of his need to address the modern understanding of beauty and to um, dialogue with such figures as David Hume and Francis Hutchinson, um, and uh, Lord Shaftesbury and uh, Edmund Burke and uh, people who are um, the authors of the theory of taste in the modern sense, as well as with rationalist philosophers in the in the German tradition who were uh, also in many ways um, Platonizing philosophers. So Kant is is this nexus figure that is drawing together uh, all of these different strains and comes to um, define the modern system of aesthetics as we have come to know it in the mainstream of academic philosophy. And this has also had various influences outside of academic philosophy in the larger culture as well. Um, in, the, in the very conception of the aesthetic, in formalism, in the idea of a disinterested pleasure, um, and in other ways too. Now, what I want to do is talk about Kant's analysis of beauty here through a reading of certain sections of this work, the uh, Critique der Urteilskraft, which has been variously uh, translated into English. Um, the older translation 
was the critique of judgment. And I'll be using this um, older edition as the main one, the James Creed Meredith translation, venerable old translation, which is noted for its readability. And for that reason, this is the one that I often recommend to students uh, who just want to read the Critique of Judgment. If you want a more accurate translation, we have the more recent Critique of the Power of Judgment, um, which is translated by uh, Geyer and um, Matthews, Paul Geyer and Eric Matthews. Uh, and this work is more accurate, more a more literal translation of the Critique of Giles Croft, but it's uh, also less readable. And so um, we'll be consulting both of these translations here. Now, uh, in looking at the critique of judgment, we find a number of divisions. There's the major division between the critique of aesthetic judgment and the critique of teleological judgment. Uh, and then within the critique of aesthetic judgment, uh, there's an analytic and a dialectic, which more or less um, is meant to emulate the division of the previous two critiques, especially the critique of pure reason, which set the paradigm for a, a work that is to be considered a Kantian critique in good standing. And so um, I'm not going to necessarily slavishly adhere to uh, Kant's order of, dis of um, discussing things, although I will more or less uh, look at the um, work as he presents it. But what I want to understand uh, most of all in this work is what, how Kant sees the status of the beautiful, and in particular, what the character is of Kant's famous um, subjective universality, which is his way of accommodating the various strains of objectivism and subjectivism in the history of Western philosophy of the beautiful. So what is subjective universality in Kant? It seems to be a contradiction in terms because we think of the subjective as something that necessarily is particular, uh, that's relative to particular individuals, that doesn't have any kind of universal validity, but it belongs to the character of the beautiful according to Kant to have universal validity. What we find in Kant is what I might describe as a sort of psychologism. Uh, there's an attempt to give a psychological explanation of the beautiful, and it's not entirely clear always what the status of this psychology, psychological explanation is. We have, in the critique of pure reason, this transcendental psychology, which is evidently not meant to be um, an empirical psychology, the psychology that could result from the study of human beings and their behavior but rather is intended to be something that makes experience possible in the first place, but nonetheless is understood in, in terms that are defined mentalistically. So we have in Kant the theory of the faculties, the theory of the faculties, and everything for Kant is going to come back to faculties, powers of the mind. Of course, what this mind is, Kant is quite explicit in the critique of pure reason, is something that we don't know in itself. We don't know what, what the mind is really in itself because we don't experience it. We just presuppose it as a kind of framework within which experience occurs for us. That's the characteristic Kantian understanding. And so his theory of the beautiful is going to be framed in a similar uh, type of faculty language. That's what we find right from the get-go in the Critique of Judgment. So let's look at this work here. This is, I'll be citing the uh, Academy, the Prussian Academy um, standard pagination here, since we're working with different uh, translations as well as um, at times the original. Um, so Kant says uh, in the first um, section of the first book, of the first moment of the analytic of the beautiful. So we have this analytic of the beautiful, an analysis of the beautiful. Uh, is Kant going to be giving um, a definition of the beautiful? This is something that in analytic philosophy, uh, those who have been trained in that 
uh, style of philosophy are used to expecting when we're dealing with key terms, whether they're terms like subjective and objective themselves, or terms like mind or truth or knowledge, that we're going to be looking for a definition, which is understood to be necessary and sufficient conditions. Is this the way Kant thinks of philosophy? Those of you who are familiar with Kant's critique of pure reason will already know that Kant tends to eschew definitions in philosophy. He doesn't believe, contrary to someone like, say, Spinoza, that real definitions can be had in philosophy. You can define things in logic and mathematics because you're constructing the objects in a certain sense yourself, according to Kant. You're constructing mathematical objects. You can define anything however you want because you're the author of these concepts. But when you're dealing with uh, synthetic a priori truths, when you're dealing with substantive factual assertions, whether they're in metaphysics or in physics, whether they're in the empirical realm or in the a priori realm, uh, we, we have to have some kind of um, given content of experience in order to be able to define things. And the problem is that we never really have an adequate um, quantity of experience to be able to give a final definition of anything. We can define things pragmatically, of course, uh, for particular purposes. But in terms of defining it essentially, um, the nature of our knowledge, based as it is on experience and the wedding of experiences to our um, faculty of understanding, is not something that we can ever give a final definition for. So beauty is going to be like this. However, what Kant does um, is offer something that approximates a definition, which is he gives this analysis of the beautiful in the section that's called the analytic of the beautiful. He gives this analysis in four, what he calls it, moments. Four moments, which are supposed to correspond to the, um, the four moments of judgment in the, in the first critique, in the uh, transcendental analytic, um, where in which he analyzes the logical structure of judgment, which leads to his table of the categories and the transcendental deduction. Uh, so Kant is, is following out that plan because he sees uh, aesthetic judgment as a form of judgment. And so this form of judgment can be analyzed, which doesn't issue in definitions, but rather issues in what he calls uh, Erklärungen, or um, explanations. Uh, this, the Meredith translation uh, translates this as the definitions. Um, but as I just explained, that is perhaps not the best um, translation. The um, Geyer Matthews also translates it as definitions. But if you go back to the uh, German, these are described as uh, Erklärungen. Erklärungen. So they're um, elucidations or clarifications. Uh, they're intended to make the concept of the beautiful clearer, but not to give any kind of finality, the finality of a definition in the sense of necessary and sufficient condition. So it's fine, of course, it's a fine translation to translate a clearing as definition, but we have to understand that by definition here, Kant does not mean a necessary and sufficient conditions uh, in the sense in which one might expect a definition to contain such conditions within the context of contemporary analytic philosophy. Okay, so the first moment, um, which is supposed to describe the quality of the judgment of taste according to Kant. The first moment of the judgment of taste, the moment of quality. So what is the quality of the judgment of taste? Um, and this is quality as opposed to quantity. So it has to do with intention versus extension, and intention in the sense of the, the sort of inner or intrinsic character, as opposed to the scope of the beautiful. The inner or intrinsic character of the beautiful as opposed to the, the scope of the beautiful. What the beautiful ranges over, that's the quantity. But the quality is the intrinsic um, or the intentional character of the beautiful. 
the intention. And the answer to the question of what the quality of the beautiful is, is given right off the bat, that the judgment of taste is aesthetic. Aesthetic, which is a term that uh, is derived from the Greek term for sensation. And we get in the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, of course, a major section called the Transcendental Aesthetic, which doesn't at all deal with the beautiful, or what we think of as aesthetic experience in the contemporary sense, but rather deals with the faculty of sensibility. Um, and because it's transcendental, a transcendental aesthetic, it deals with the formal conditions of sensibility, namely space and time for Kant. Here, uh, Kant is introducing a new sense of aesthetic, which becomes then the contemporary sense. It evolves through the history of our culture into the contemporary sense. Kant didn't invent this sense. It goes back to Alexander Baumgarten, who first tried to uh, create a science of the aesthetic, as he described it, which is intended to be a science of the principles of sensibility. So you have, on the one hand, the intellect, the abstract conceptual faculty of the mind, um, the intellect or the understanding, Verstand for uh, Kant, the understanding, which deals in concepts and abstract principles. It's what allows us to ascertain things like the laws of nature, the, you know, the meaning of words and so forth. And then you have sensibility, which deals with sensations of the five senses, as well as the form in which these sensations occur, which is uh, in space and in time. That's Kant's basic definition, division of the faculties from the critique of pure reason. Here, Kant is going to be considering the possibility of a judgment that is purely aesthetic, meaning one that does not involve the intellect or the understanding at all, but that depends purely on the um, capacities of sensation. And the, the problem here is that for Kant, all of the normal five senses that lead us to perceive external objects um, do not amount to objects until they are synthesized in accordance with the requirements of the understanding and our sensations are then brought under a concept. Here, um, what Kant is going to be considering is the possibility of a kind of judgment that doesn't have that structure or that doesn't result from that kind of a process. So how is this going to be possible? He says, if we wish to discern whether anything is beautiful or not, we do not refer the representation of it to the object by means of understanding with a view to cognition, but by means of the imagination, we refer the representation to the subject and its feeling of pleasure or displeasure. So if we wish to discern, if we wish to apply this concept of beauty or the predicate is beautiful, to anything. Of course, grammatically, it seems like what we want to say is, you know, that statue is beautiful. We're making it what seems grammatically to be a predication of beauty of a subject that has an objective reference. The statue is an object in the world, independently of my mind. And it seems like what I'm doing is, is attributing a property, namely beauty to that object that exists objectively independently in my mind. However, this is not the case for Kant. He's saying that what's actually happening is that we, we have this representation um, that we're referring not to the object, but to the subject. So that it, it sounds like what he's saying is that the beauty really is being referred not to the object, but to, um, not to the statue, but to me. When I judge a statue to be beautiful, I'm really saying something about myself, not about the statue. And what I'm saying is something about my feeling of pleasure or displeasure. The judgment of taste, therefore, is not a cognitive judgment and so not, not logical, <coughs> but is aesthetic, which means that it's one whose determining ground cannot be other than subjective. Every reference of representations is capable of being objective, even that of sensations, in which case it signifies the real in an empirical representation. But the one exception to this is the feeling of pleasure or displeasure. This denotes nothing in the object, but is a feeling 
which the subject has of itself and of the manner of which it is affected by the representation. So Kant is actually taking a stand here on an issue that is a subject of much controversy and very difficult to settle, which is um, what is pleasure, ontologically or metaphysically speaking. We say that we take pleasure in the object. Um, you know, for example, I might buy the, the statue that I find to be beautiful. I buy that statue. I purchase it to have it in my home because I take pleasure in that statue. I'm taking pleasure in the statue. And one might very well think that the, the pleasure is a kind of character or quality of objective sensation, that the pleasure belongs to the the smoothness or the whiteness uh, or the symmetry of form, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of the statue. And so the pleasure is, as it were, objectively in the statue. Uh, this is this is a controversy that you find also in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, for example. Is the is pleasure something like a an epiphenomenal quality of other objective qualities of a thing? Or is it something that is just in me? And this is a very difficult uh, philosophical question to settle. But here, Kant seems to be saying that it's actually in the subject. There's a, there's a sharp subject-object divide, and the pleasure is really in the subject. It's not in, in the object. He says, to apprehend a regular and appropriate building, that is a building that is, you know, has proportions, regularity, you, you're, you get this, the sense in the background here that as Kant is developing his aesthetic theory, there's a particular aesthetic in the background. And, and it's maybe worth noting here this um, sort of ambiguity that occurs in the, in the term aesthetic. We can talk about aesthetics. And of course, in, in German, the, the word aesthetic is not, um, this, it doesn't differentiate between these two the plural aesthetics or the singular aesthetic. Uh, in English, we have the ability to say, okay, I study aesthetics in philosophy. That's my specialization. Um, but my particular aesthetic is, let's say, a postmodern aesthetic. Um, someone else might claim that they have a classical aesthetic or a romantic aesthetic or a modernist aesthetic. And we kind of have a, a vague sense of, of what those things are. And this is what's studied by art historians. This is the kind of thing that um, art critics need to know about in order to um, have a language that they can use to, to discuss and to analyze objects and so forth. Different aesthetics, different ways of um, categorizing art objects uh, within different genres broadly construed. Uh, different tendencies of ways of presenting art and so forth, uh, different styles and aspects and qualities of art, the Baroque aesthetic versus the Rococo aesthetic. You know, someone says, I love the Baroque aesthetic of Viennese architecture. And someone else says, you know, Vienna makes me dizzy and nauseous. And I can understand why, you know, some of the leading lights of modernist architecture came out of that milieu because, you know, it really was needed to to strip everything down and get down back to the basics again and to clear the palette, so to speak, of all that busyness of the Baroque aesthetic. Modernist aesthetic is the aesthetic of our times. Someone else says, no, it's, you know, the postmodern aesthetic is, is a better reflection of today's society or something like that, right? Well, what Kant clearly uh, adheres to... Um, that emerges through the analytic of the beautiful and through the critique of judgment as a whole is a um, classicist or neoclassicist aesthetic, a very typical uh, enlightenment orientation. He's right on the cusp of romanticism and in many ways helps to usher in romanticism, but he is not a, a romantic. Uh, he's not a fan of the contemporary Sturm und Drang movement, which is mainly a literary and dramatic movement. Uh, at, in his time. Um, he's a very much a, a classicist. So the ideals of, um, just to oversimplify, of, of, of proportion, symmetry, order, rationality, are for him taken for granted as aesthetic ideals, as really as timeless, universal aesthetic ideals. Um, even though presumably he's aware of other aesthetic um, 
aesthetics, I should say, other aesthetic orientations, uh, he tends to, along with figures like David Hume, for example, uh, to take for granted that this um, neoclassicist aesthetic is really the perfection of the human aesthetic sensibility. Um, so to apprehend a regular and appropriate building with one's cognitive faculties, he's taking for granted there that regularity, uh, proportion, that these are appropriate um, characteristics for a beautiful building. Be the mode of representation clear or confused is quite a different thing from being conscious of this representation with an accompanying sensation of delight. There he seems to quite clearly separate out the objective perception of the building. Yes, I perceive that building. I perceive that it is, you know, it's symmetrical. It's got, you know, um, you have the one house here and the other house here. And they're equally distant from the, you know, the great dome in the center of the building and so forth. Um, I understand that this is a, you know, classic, rational, appropriate design. To understand that is one thing. To take delight in it or to have an accompanying sensation of delight uh, is another thing. So he seems to be placing pleasure very clearly here externally to the perception. The perception is one thing, the pleasure is something else that accompanies the perception or doesn't, in, 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 um, as the case may be. Here, the representation is referred solely to the subject and what is more to its feeling of life under the name of pleasure or displeasure. So what is pleasure? Kant begins and interspersed throughout this work, you'll get pieces here and there uh, of a theory of pleasure. And I'll make note of these as we go through. But here he begins by saying it's our feeling of life. Pleasure is um, the feeling of life in us being increased. You find other figures of the Enlightenment having a similar kind of theory. Uh, Spinoza, for example, in his theory of the kanatu, so the striving, uh, has a similar kind of theory that we, we take pleasure, or what Spinoza calls joy, uh, in those things that increase our activity. And conversely, when we feel sadness or displeasure, that's because of the decrease of our uh, feelings of life. Spinoza, as we'll see, actually plays quite an important and prominent role in the critique of judgment, uh, not so much in the critique of aesthetic judgment, but later on in the critique of teleological judgment. So Kant very well could have had Spinoza's theory in mind here, as well as other, there are other figures as well that um, have similar theories. Um, this forms the basis of a quite separate faculty of discriminating and estimating that contributes nothing to knowledge. So taste is what he's referring to here, a faculty of discriminating or estimating. Um, this is given in the footnote. The definition of taste here relies upon is that it is the faculty of estimating the beautiful. And this is a very traditional understanding of taste, it's a, a commonsensical, even today, understanding of taste as an ability to estimate things, an ability to discriminate um, between good taste and bad taste. But Kant is saying here that this is done solely through pleasure. It's not an objective perception of anything that's objectively in the object. It's just a kind of registering of pleasure or displeasure in us. And of course, this raises the question, because we do talk about good taste and bad taste, uh, what sense does it make to talk about there being something that's in bad taste if, if all that means, and we're not assuming that Kant is saying here that that's all that it means, but let's just go with this for the time being. Um, suppose it is all just a matter of my disliking the, the thing that I call in bad taste. By what right do I say it's in bad taste? And here there, there runs the risk of uh, eliminating the judgmental character of taste. Kant clearly wants to maintain the idea that the judgment of the beautiful, while it is a judgment of taste, is still a judgment. It's not just an expressive. He's not an expressivist here like the expressivist moral theorists in, in metaethics, emotivists and others. 
who said that basically, even though and then they find their their godfather in, in Hume, so to speak, um, e even though it seems like when I say, say uh, make a what's known as an evaluative judgment, I say that that's good or that's bad. Even though it seems like what I'm doing is making a judgment that could be assessed according to truth or falsity, what actually is going on is that I'm just expressing myself. It's as if I was saying, oh, damn, or ouch, right? I I'm not really making a judgment of anything. I'm just expressing sort of how I feel. And so it's inappropriate to assess um, and that kind of ejaculation in terms of truth or falsity. I mean, you might assess it in terms of sincerity, whether I'm putting you on or whether I'm actually sincerely in pain, uh, but you don't assess it that in, in terms of, you know, the truth or falsity about the thing that is causing it. It's not a judgment of the, uh, such a thing having such and such a predicate. Um, at, at best, it's a relationship to me. So Kant says, all it does is to compare the given representation in the subject with the entire faculty of representations of which the mind is conscious in the feeling of its state. And this is totally uh, obscure and unintelligible in this context because he's alluding to here what he will uh, elaborate upon later on in section 9, which is uh, his famous doctrine of the harmonious free play of the faculties, which is the ultimate explanation of the pleasure and the beautiful, according to him. Um, but here he says is that what we're doing is we're comparing an object, when we judge something to be beautiful, we're comparing an object to the entire faculty of representations. So we have a faculty here. The, what is the faculty of representations? Well, we have different representations, um, according to the critique of pure reason, we have um, discursive representations, representations that are abstract concepts. We have um, sensible representations, uh, concrete fields, and these are all representations, which is a generic term for the contents of the mind. And we have different faculties that produce these different representations. And what Kant is saying here is in the beautiful, we're relating the object to our entire faculty of representations. Or we might put it this way, we're relating it to all of our faculties that are involved in representing, representation of objects at once. At once. Now, that seems to be different from pleasure or displeasure. So which is it? Is it that we're referring the object to our faculty of pleasure and displeasure, which evidently is a power we have to have pleasures or to have displeasures? So are we referring to the object that purports to be beautiful to our faculty of pleasure or displeasure? Or are we referring to it, as he says, to our entire faculty of representations, to all of our representational faculties? That is, um, to the understanding, sensibility, and introduce a new one, very important in the critique of judgment. Um, but that you'll also be familiar with this from the critique of pure reason, the faculty of the imagination, the imagination. These are all faculties of representations, but but they're, they're not pleasure. There's something else besides pleasure. So, what is what is what are we actually referring this object to? The statue, for example, are we referring it to our pleasure or displeasure, or are we referring it to all of these faculties of representation? So, there, already we're getting some questions here, which are not answered in this section. Section two gives us the famous. Um, predicate of the beautiful that um, many will take, including Kant, to be really kind of the central point of this moment of the analysis of the beautiful, which is namely disinterestedness, disinterestedness. Um, the account that became so important, especially for um, Schopenhauer, but then through the influence of Schopenhauer in the, in the later 19th century, came to be a kind of um, hegemonic account of aesthetic experience um, in the later 19th and into the first half of the 20th century when it increasingly came under attack. Um, it was already under attack in the late 19th century by uh, Nietzsche, who criticized this idea. But for Kant here, the um, judgment of the beautiful based as it is on a pleasure, is nonetheless disinterested, disinterested. Now, when we relate objects to our pleasure or displeasure, that would seem to be 
the very paradigm of an interest that we take in the object. Um, that is to say, if something is a cause of pleasure for me, um, clearly uh, it seems I have a motive to acquire, to maintain, to preserve, to appropriate that cause of pleasure to me. Um, and Kant, indeed, he says, the delight which we connect with the representation of the real existence of an object is called interest. Such a delight, therefore, always involves a reference to the faculty of desire, either as its determining ground or else as necessarily implicated with its determining ground. So I always have a kind of... Um, interest in an object when I connect pleasure to the representation of its interest. Um, exist, sorry, its existence, rather. If I connect my pleasure to the existence of the object, then that will always involve an interest. Um, so, What's this business, though, about its determining ground or else is necessarily implicated with its determining ground? So that is to say that either um, something causes me pleasure because it represents the satisfaction of my desire or else it causes a desire in me. And this is going to correspond to the distinction between uh, those pleasures I take in the good versus those pleasures I take in the agreeable um, or the merely pleasant. What, the, what pleases me in sensations. So the, the example is this. If, um, if I have a good character, then... Um, According to Kant, I should take pleasure in seeing justice done. Now, it may turn out that, for example, uh, let's say um, I made a mistake on my taxes and I believe that I was entitled to a large refund from the government. Um, that would be something that would gratify my senses, my sensations, because I could imagine all sorts of things that I, I could use that money for that would satisfy my inclinations, you know, um, things I could purchase and so forth that would satisfy my inclinations. Um, however, if we suppose in this example that I later discover the government sends me a letter and says, actually, you made a calculation error here. You're not actually due to the, you're not actually um, do this refund. Of course, I would immediately feel disappointed. But on the other hand, according to Kant, um, in another respect, I would feel pleasure because my desire that justice should occur would be satisfied, even though this would not satisfy my sensations uh, because I wouldn't be able to gratify my inclinations. Nonetheless, it would satisfy my reason. It would satisfy my reason. And, and that's the contrast Kant wants to um, capture here when he says that it involves a reference to the faculty of desire. Um, either as its determining ground, desire is the determining ground of my pleasure in seeing justice done. My desire, in other words, for the good, right? So we can say, well, I'm glad that I, I see that I wasn't entitled to that refund, so I'm glad that I was corrected because I desire that the good be done, namely that, in this case, justice be done. And I don't want to have unf an unfair advantage. I don't want to be a tax cheat. And so I'm, I'm glad that I was spared that. Um, of course, that's very different from the kind of desire that, ar that arises from having my inclination satisfied. And here, what Kant has in mind is that I experience something, um, you know, for example, I discover a new food that I really, really enjoy that I never had eaten before. You know, I eat sushi for the first time or something like that. And I discover, wow, I really love sushi. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Once in a while, I start to get a craving for sushi that I never would have had before, before I had it. And then all of a sudden I said, you know, I have a taste for sushi today. That's the, that's the um, pleasure being the determining ground for my desire. Whereas in the case of the good, it's the desire for the good, the rational desire for the good. That's the basis of my pleasure. Um, so that's, 
what he has in mind here. Now, where the question is whether something is beautiful, we do not want to know whether we or anyone else are or even could be concerned in the real existence of the thing, but rather what estimate we form of it on mere contemplation. If anyone asks me whether I consider that the palace I see before me is beautiful, I may perhaps reply that I do not care for things of that sort that are merely made to be gaped at. Or I may reply in the same strain as the Iroquois Sachem who said that nothing in Paris pleased him better than the eating houses. Notice I may even go a step further and inveigh with the vigor of a Rousseau against the vanity of the great who spend the sweat of the people on such superfluous things. Or in fine, I may quite easily persuade myself that if I found myself on an uninhabited island without hope of ever again coming among men, I could conjure such a palace into existence by a mere wish. If I could do this, I should still not trouble to do so, so long as I had a hut there that was comfortable enough for me. All this may be admitted and approved, only it is not the point now at issue. So notice what he's saying here is, and he's, he's um, describing here both moral judgments and also judgments of pleasure. So you have, you know, Kant has this sort of, um, of course, um, prejudice that the Iroquois, you know, only care about um, food and they, they can't appreciate the beautiful. Um, but uh, without following him that, we can take the basic point away from this, which is that one might say that, um, you know, y you attribute beauty to the palace um, and according to Kant that means that you are uh, attributing a pleasure to your experience of the palace and you might therefore um, be a sort of purely quantitative hedonist and assess that pleasure relative to other possible pleasures that you might have. So you know, do you want to go out on an architectural tour of Paris or would you rather sit in the French restaurant and eat the food? And you might say, well, you know what? I actually get more, more intense. Think about like J.S. Mill's way of assessing pleasures uh, that he considers in utilitarianism before he, of course, criticizes it to distinguish um, quantitative versus qualitative differences among pleasures. But the, the, the sort, of <coughs> sort of Benthamite uh, account um, you, you can consider a pleasure due to its intensity, due to its duration, um, and you know, perhaps due to you know some other um, things that you can quantify about the pleasure. And in this case, you might assess beauty compared to other t possible pleasures, and just say that you know it's it's less pleasurable ultimately, and so less valuable. Um, but for Kant, this would be to miss the point of what's going on in the judgment of the beautiful. It's not merely a judgment of pleasure. So that's a very important point. It's not merely um, something that is to be quantitatively compared to other possible pleasures, but rather we're dealing with something that's qualitatively significant as well. But the qualitative significance is not, as is very natural, especially nowadays uh, in the 21st century, um, to compare you know, the, the palace to our moral ideas and to say, what an injustice, you know, think about all the modest um, houses that could have been built um, using the money that was used to build that palace and that could have um, housed homeless people, for example, or all the other things that could have been done. So we, we shake our fist at the palace in moral indignation, this kind of idea. Kant is saying that not only the, the uh, Iroquois' preference for food over um, architectural appreciation, but also this, is, uh, this moral judgment he associates with Rousseau's condemnation of the vanity of the aristocracy. Um, also, this kind of Rousseauian judgment is not, is not getting the, the point. Um, to make a moral judgment is to change the subject just as much as to reduce the pleasure and the beautiful to a mere quantitative sum to be assessed against other quantitative sums um, is to miss the point of the beautiful. All of this is, is not the point at issue. 
what is at issue then? And here's where this idea of the existence of the object being what is accounting for its interest comes into the play. All one wants to know is whether the mere representation of the object is to my liking, no matter how indifferent I may be to the real existence of the object of this representation. In other words, when we're judging the beautiful, we are to abstract from the existence of the object and merely look at the merely look at it as, as if it were representation. There's a kind of um, phenomenological epoche or bracketing that, that seems to be going on here. We're not considering the, whether the object exists. We're not considering how it stands in causal connections with other, with other things. We're merely considering its representation. Of course, this is impossible to do when we're comparing um, or when we're assessing the pleasure that is to be gained from food, right? F the pleasure that is to be gained from food is inseparable from the causal effect it has upon my body as we see, for example, in the fact that foods that I find delicious when I'm hungry, um, I would find nauseating or repulsive if I'm overly full. Similarly, there's a causal connection that depends upon the real existence of the object um, that comes into play when we're dealing with a moral judgment. It's because of the causal relationship between the expenditure of money on a palace and the deprivation of the poor in terms of their housing that our moral condemnation comes into play here. Um, and Kant is saying we need to abstract from all that. We need to abstract from all the causal relationships that the object stands into and just look at, look at its representation. Just look at it as a representation. It is quite plain that in order to say that the object is beautiful and to show that I have taste, Everything turns on the meaning which I can give to this representation and not on any factor which makes me dependent on the real existence of the object. Everyone must allow that a judgment on the beautiful which is tinged with the slightest interest is very partial and not a pure judgment of taste. One must not be in the least prepossessed in favor of the real existence of the thing, but must preserve complete indifference in this respect in order to play the part of the judge in matters of taste. Um, the guy or Matthew says that everyone must admit that a judgment about beauty in which there is mixed the least interest is very partial. One must not be in the least biased in favor of the existence of the thing, but must be entirely indifferent in this respect, right? So it, it's the idea that you need to, as it were, in order to judge the beautiful, in order to judge the beautiful, one needs to under, undergo a kind of introspection and soul searching to identify whether or not one has a bias or prejudice either for or against the existence of the thing in order to judge it with taste. And this is clear in the case of Rousseau. Rousseau clearly has a bias or prejudice against there being these you know, excessively luxurious palaces that only serve the vanity of the rich at the expense of the suffering of the poor that creates a very strong morally based bias against the existence of the palace. And so Kant is saying he is disqualified from being able to judge it, whether it's beautiful or not. He cannot judge it aesthetically or more technically, more exactly in Kant's language, he cannot make a pure judgment of taste. So you get this language of purity versus adulteration, right? Your judgment is adulterated. You are a biased judge. And this is an uh, idea very familiar from legal ethics, right? A judge needs to recuse herself from a particular case because it is assumed that she cannot make a pure judgment in this case, that her judgment would be adulterated by the interest that she has in the outcome of the case. That kind of idea is precisely what Kant is, is getting at. Here. So to judge something beautiful, we must um, not have any concern for the, in, the existence of the object, but judge it purely by its representation. That's what Kant is saying. And if we are unable to do this, we are unable to um, issue a pure judgment of taste. This contrasts the judgment of the beautiful with both the judgment of the agreeable and the judgment of the good.
So the, the agreeable, or the, the we may translate it also as the pleasant, would probably be a more um, common, um, it's das angenehm. Uh, the, uh, the angenehm is in German the um, judgment, or the, the, the word for the, the, the merely pleasant. Right? And Kant is, is here describing something, therefore, that agrees with me. This agrees with me. Um, so I think that this thing um, will be something that I will find agreeable. Uh, and as a result, I decide I'm going to acquire it. Um, that's the basic basic idea here. So it, it's a the simple animal relationship to the thing. That is agreeable, which the senses find pleasing in sensation. So animals as well as humans are able to find things to be agreeable. Um, in section three, Kant distinguishes between the kind of sensation or the sense of sensation in which we're referring to what's merely subjective versus the sense in which sensation refers to the representation of the objective facts about an object. So um, it, it, I won't go through the details of this, but the upshot is just to say that the, the sensation of pleasure or displeasure is unique among the sensations in that it is a sensation that is always referred only to the subject. It's purely subjective. Um, it can't be referred to an object. So, um, you know, I can think of, for example, the uh, the blueness of a particular garment, or let's say the blue that's on the American flag, or the Union Jack, or what have you. I can think of that blue as um, something that's in me, in the sense that it's a secondary quality that is a result of the causal interaction between light waves that are bouncing off of the um, or being emitted by the flag and that are being registered by my sight and so forth. But I can also think of, the, of course, the blue as being an objective sensation that's in the object that, that represents something, maybe not directly, but at least in an indirect way, represents something in the object. Whereas what Kant wants to say, it seems, is that pleasure and displeasure is, is not in the object in any sense, not even in the minimal sense in which the blueness of the flag is in, in some way representing something that is actually in the object, even if it's indirect. Um, so when he's talking about the agreeable, the agreeable is something that is purely in me. Uh, and so he introduces a particular language to describe this. He says that the beautiful, sort of the, the agreeable rather, is something that's purely in me. Um, we say that it, the agreeable, we say of the agreeable, not that it pleases, but that it gratifies. I do not accord it a simple approval, but inclination is aroused by it. So that's this sense that I described earlier, where the pleasure in the agreeable or the pleasure in the merely pleasant is the determining ground of a desire, the determining ground of an inclination for something. Um, like when I eat sushi, I come to have a craving for this. So that's that's what gratification is for Kant. And what he wants to say then is that the, he's going to want to say that neither the good, you know, the um, perception that a just uh, act has been performed, for example, which pleases me, it doesn't. We don't say it gratifies me, according to Kant. It's, he's introducing language to make these differentiations. And similarly, the beautiful is not something that gratifies, but rather there's a different relation. Um, he summarizes these in, in section five. This is around uh, Academy 209, 210, where he says, the agreeable, the beautiful, and the good thus denote three different relations of representations to the feeling of pleasure and displeasure as a feeling in respect of which we distinguish different objects or modes of representation. Also, the corresponding expressions which indi indicate our satisfaction in them is different. The agreeable is what gratifies a man. The beautiful, what simply pleases him. The good is what is esteemed or approved. <clears throat> 
So, uh, as I said earlier, the, in the case of the agreeable, I have a kind of causal relationship with the object. The object causes a change in my body, which gives rise to this gratification that in turn gives rise to desire. That's the picture. Causal object causes change in me, causes pleasure and a consequent desire. But the pleasure here is gratification. Within the case of the beautiful, the relationship between uh, desire and causal effect is actually inverted from what it is in the case of the agreeable because in the case of the pleasure in the good, I first have a desire, which according to Kant arises from reason. And my rational understanding of the good, I understand that it's good that justice be done. And as a consequence, I am motivated to cause justice to be done or to help to facilitate it is to the best of my ability. In other words, I will it. I take all the available means within my power to pursue that end, to realize it in the world, to cause it to happen. And then when I see that it happens, when I see that I've made justice be done, I I don't say I'm gratified, although, you know, in English you might say that, but according to Kant, you should really say that um, what you've, you've, you've accomplished is something that is to be esteemed, right? Something that's worthy of being honored, in other words, to be esteemed. Um, or to be approved would be another way to translate this. I approve of that as a kind of pleasure. It's not gratification. Um, you know, think about this example where I was told, hey, guess what? You don't get a tax refund. That doesn't gratify me in the sense that I'm disappointed. My inclinations are frustrated. But nonetheless, I approve of it. And there's, so there's a kind of, as it were, higher level pleasure um, that is associated with the satisfaction of the desire for the good. But the point is that both of these are distinguished from the beautiful because both of these are interested pleasures. In the one case, I have an interest of the senses, an interest in the existence of some object that's going to causally impact me and gratify some appetite or craving that I have. In the case of the good, um, I have an interest in the existence of the object because my will is to, to realize something in the world. Not just, to, you know, of course, you um, don't satisfy yourself if you're a person of moral character with just imagining a perfect world, you know, playing John Lennon's Imagine on Infinite Loop or something like that. But you want to actually do something. You want to do something to causally create that reality in the world. And so both of these cases of gratification and of the, the kind of approval that results from seeing the good realized both of them involve the real existence of something. And that, that's what Kant defines as concerned with an interest, the real existence of something. But the beautiful is different from that. The beautiful is defined, I mean, in, in Meredith, there was what merely pleases. Um, same thing in Guy or Matthews. The beautiful just simply pleases him. There's a unique relationship, <coughs> it seems, between the faculty of pleasure and the beautiful. The beautiful is, because it is disinterested, it's not concerned with the existence of objects, it, it doesn't concern itself with the will or the faculty of desire, and so its pleasure is pure pleasure. The pleasure of the beautiful is a pure pleasure. It's not a pleasure that is, you know, as it were, part of a process that's going to issue in an action as the gratification of the, in the agreeable and the approval that is connected with the good are. Both of those things uh, are connected to action, connected to the agents um, changing the world or being changed by the world. Whereas the beautiful, as it were, leaves everything as it is and is a purely contemplative pleasure and therefore is a pure pleasure. It's pleasure, period. It's not pleasure for the sake of some end, for, as the motive to some end, or as the consequence of something that's motivated by reason to pursue an end in the case of the good. Okay. Definition of the beautiful derived from the first moment. Taste is the faculty of estimating an object or mode of representation 
by means of a delight or aversion apart from any interest. The object of such a delight is called beautiful. And um, Geyer Matthew says, taste is the faculty for judging an object or a kind of representation through a satisfaction or dissatisfaction without any interest. The object of such a satisfaction is called beautiful. So the difference here is whether we um, translate the... Um, Volgefallen as delight or satisfaction. But the basic idea, I think, is unaffected here, that um, the object of a disinterested pleasure is called beautiful. So he's not saying here that the beautiful is a disinterested pleasure. Um, he doesn't quite go that far to identify beauty with pleasure. Beauty is just a species of pleasure. In this taxonomy that he gave of, you know, the agreeable, the which is a gratification, the um, pleasure in the good, which is an approval or an esteem, and the, the beautiful, which is a pure pleasure, a satisfaction, a delight. He never goes to say that, well, the beautiful is a type of pleasure, the object of a delight is called beautiful. So there's still a distinction here between the object of the delight and the pleasure of the beautiful. Now, there's some controversy among controversy, uh, commentators whether Kant is saying here that the pleasure in the beautiful is caused by the object. Uh, it seems on a common sense level that one would want to say that, but keep in mind that there is this important distinction in terms of the causal relationship between the pleasure in the agreeable and the pleasure in the good. And the beautiful is neither of those two, but it's not really clear whether with respect to the causal relationship between the pleasure and the object, it's more like the agreeable or more like the good. So in the case of the agreeable, clearly the, the object, the sushi, causes pleasure and then causes that, that causes a desire. In the case of the good, however... It's not that the justice done causes me the pleasure. It's rather that I cause the act in the world, the natural act in the world, to have the character of goodness. And so I have as much a claim to be the cause of the pleasure as the object does. Because it's only through my interpretation of this act as being a, an act of justice that it comes to be pleasant to me. And of course, Kant's imagining the situation where I'm not just a disinterested observer of an act of justice, but in the typical case, because of the practical orientation of Kant's uh, ethics, I'm going to be the agent who's actually going to be causing this effect. Um, so the causal relationship runs from the subject to the object rather than from the object to the subject in the case of the good. So the question, a question that arises is, in the, which is it in the case of the beautiful? Is it that the object causes an effect in me? Or is it rather that I somehow um, apply some kind of um, framework or perspective onto the world and only in light of my application of that framework or perspective does, as it were, the object shine forth as beautiful? I don't think we can answer that yet at this point. Uh, empirically minded philosophers will naturally tend to assume that, of course, the object, you know, the flower or whatever causes you to be pleased by its beauty. More, let's call them idealistically reminded, minded philosophers will assume the opposite, that no, actually, you have to have some kind of conceptual scheme or something um, analogous to it that is going to um, enable the object to shine forth its beauty. So that's a question that's an open question to be further considered um, as we go through the other sections of the critique of judgment in future videos.